Imagine, you're hiding at the top of the school stairwell. It reeks of old gym shoes and paint. Your brother's used to your quirks, but this one is new. Why aren't we eating here again? You know that kid with the crew cut? I might have accidentally bumped into him in assembly. Now he's looking for me. Your brother sighs, then... So this is where the maggots come to feed. He finds you, the bully. He's got his arms crossed, that stupid smile on his face. You're just deciding how to answer when you feel a sharp pain in the middle of your shoulder blades, and then you're flying down the stairs. The crew cut follows you down, taking the stairs two at a time. At the bottom, his pals are waiting, and it dawns on you. This is the plan. And then you feel the first boot deep in your rib cage, and then another. You hear your brother. Leave him alone. There's fear in his voice, but what can he do? You're outnumbered, and then your mind drifts off. The thuds recede. You think about one of your favorite books. Today, it's Lord of the Flies. You are on an island. Your plane has crashed. You and the others are alone. The adults are all gone dead. You're gathered together around a fire pit, and that's when you see it. A thing was crawling out of the forest. It came darkly, uncertainly. The shrill screaming that rose before the beast was like a pain. The beast stumbled into the horseshoe. Kill the beast. Cut his throat. Spill his blood. Back on the school stairwell, the crew cut's face is red, frenzied. He pulls your head up by the hair and bashes your skull into the ground again and again. The kicks keep coming, your back, your ribs, the center of your belly. Will it ever stop? The thing is, fear can't hurt you any more than a dream. And then you black out. From Wondery, I'm Robbie Damon, and this is Imagined Life. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like to walk in the shoes of someone famous? On each episode of Imagined Life, we'll take you on an immersive journey into the life of someone you may think you know, maybe even admire, or the opposite. But no one realizes what it felt like to be them before the whole world knew their name. There will be clues to your identity along the way. Only at the end will you find out who you are. So sit back, let go, and imagine your life. On this episode, The Outsider. When you are five years old, you develop a habit. At least that's what they tell you, and they tell you it's strange, not normal. You're too young to know what's normal, but you will later get it because you will be an adult, and you will still have the habit, and it's still not normal. At age five, it looks like this. You'll be sitting in the middle of the living room on the brown shag carpet next to the couch, playing with your trucks, when suddenly you stop staring at some invisible point in the distance, completely checked out, frozen in time. Your brother and sister find this hilarious. Mom, he's doing it again. Not now, I'm on the phone with a client. But mom. Your brother, the more practical of the two, asks the obvious question. Is he breathing? Let me check. Your sister goes into nurse mode, pinching your nose and peering into your mouth, wiggling her fingers in front of your eyes. She claps loudly next to your head. Your brother sneaks up behind you. Boo! But you're not home. Not this home, anyway. You'll sit like this for an hour or more. Eventually, your brother and sister will leave you alone. But your mother is worried. Late at night, after the kids have gone to bed, she and your father have whispered conversations in the kitchen, where they call your habit a trance. And when the trances come more often, their worry becomes concern that you might be deaf. Your mom takes you to the doctor. They put you through a battery of tests. Everything seems normal. He's a healthy boy. We could take out the adenoids, 
Those are the glands in the back of the throat. We've had some luck with that in the past. Is there any risk? None at all. It's a quick outpatient operation. Okay, let's do it. After the operation, you get a lot of attention for your bravery by the hospital staff. Even your mom praises you for your courage, and she doesn't hand out praise often. But the operation has no effect. You still dip into a dreamlike state at the oddest moments, and the family learns to accept it as one of your quirks. When you're older, you will realize this is simply how your mind is wired, and you look at these moments as a gift. It's a way to block out the outside world and all its distractions, where you can see images in your mind's eye with clarity and detail. Algorithmic relationships, kinetic energy, and how those interrelationships affect one another. You can spin entire crystal clear worlds alive with your imagination, like a graphics computer chip. You are endlessly curious. You ask your father, where is the whole world? Your dad is an engineer, and he knows a lot of things, but he doesn't have an answer to that one. You're starting to realize adults rarely seem to have answers that are satisfying. They only see what's directly in front of them, and truly understanding the world requires more than that. You know that by the time you're five, and that makes you different, which doesn't make you any friends. You want to fit in. You really do. It's not fun being alone all the time alone in your head and alone in the world. So you lead with your strength and share all the cool things you know with anyone who will listen. That's a 74 Mustang. The first model was built in 1962. It was the first muscle car and revolutionized the way you trade upon by an outside force. That's Newton's first law. If another kid says something dumb, you are quick to set him straight. His thinking is flawed. His premise is inaccurate, unsound. No, you can't fly. The force of the planet is greater than the weight of a body. That's gravity. That's why planets orbit around the sun. Behind your back, kids call you a know-it-all. They avoid you when they see you coming. The truth is, you don't care if you're right. You really don't. It just so happens you usually are. You like learning. You like chewing on ideas. You like arguing. And you can't help blurting it out. One dark night, when the neighborhood kids are scaring themselves silly telling ghost stories, you helpfully explain, dark is just the absence of light. You're not invited back to ghost story night. If you can't make friends of your own, maybe you can share your brother's and sister's friends. You make several attempts, but it never goes well. Even when your mother tells them not to exclude you. He's just not fun, they say to your mom. To your face, they say, we don't want to play with you anymore. You will struggle with this most of your life. The combination of your awkwardness and intelligence feels like an insurmountable barrier to making friends. It keeps you on the outside, trapped in your own bubble. Your family accepts you, but they've got their own lives. Your mother is consumed with work. Your father is often on the road. Your siblings have friends. They're friends. You're lonely, sometimes unbearably so. It's an ache inside that never goes away. It feels personal. What's wrong with me? And every night before you go to sleep, you repeat a mantra, a hope for your future. I don't want to be alone. I never want to be alone. Books save you. Books spin worlds of interesting characters who don't care how different you are. You can disappear into another time and place. You read five hours a day, and by age 10, you are consuming two books a day on the weekends. There's so much to learn, all these marvelous things. And when your parents drag you to neighbors' parties and the conversation lapses into rugby and sports, you slink away to find the library. Or you'll corner the smartest person in the room and drill them with questions, trying to soak up as much of their knowledge as you can. Books not only save you, they raise you. It goes books first, then your parents. By fourth grade, you've run out of books in the school library, and you find something new to read. The Encyclopedia Britannica. Amazingly, you remember everything you read. You hate breaking away for anything, especially to eat, but your mother insists. 
She's not a traditional mother by any means, and doesn't insist on much, so you do it. But you consider meals a waste of time. Food is just fuel. Plus, when your mother cooks, it's usually healthy, gross stuff like boiled vegetables and lean protein and fruit. One night, the fruit comes disguised in lumpy green jello, but you hardly notice. You're still flying high from your trip to the moon, thanks to Air Encyclopedia Britannica. The sooner dinner is over, the sooner you'll get back into space. Your family likes to recount tales about adventures and risks taken by your forebears around the dinner table. Your grandparents once flew across the ocean in a single-engine plane. So you're pretty sure they'll be fascinated by what you just learned. Did you know the moon is 236,000 miles from the Earth? Okay, boy genius. It revolves around the Earth in an ellipse, not a circle, and the motion affects the weather on Earth. It's all interconnected. Fascinating. Mom, will you pass that gross green stuff? That's jello. That doesn't look like any jello I've ever seen. What's in there? Lumps of coal? Socks? It's fruit, and it's good for you. You need vitamin C. Did you know severe weather events often happen within a few days of the perigee? The para what? Perigee? The closest point of orbit from the moon to the Earth. Well, hop aboard next time it orbits this way. Go live with your friends, the Martians. You'd fit right in. Leave him alone. But you don't hear her. You're off in another trance. It's like the universe is downloading directly into your brain. Possibilities, relationships, interconnection. Martians don't live on the moon. If they lived at all, they'd live on Mars. I suppose it's entirely possible given the atmosphere. Your favorite books are science fiction, especially stories that take place in outer space. Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, authors who look up at the night sky and see possibility and a limitless frontier. Odd characters who go to faraway places where evil and good battle it out. Places where the good guy always wins. You find it comforting to think about a civilization that has a hand in its destiny. You often fall asleep thinking about the future and what kind of impact one person can have. What kind of impact you can have. But how? School never teaches you that stuff. School is boring, way more boring than it should be. You'd much rather build homemade rocket ships out of saltpeter and charcoal, or ride bikes with your brother, flying through the fields as fast as you can pedal, the smell of grassland cutting the air. School is predictable. You can't wait until you're old enough to get into some real adventures, make your own decisions. And that's around the time your mother makes her decision. The family is moving. Well, most of the family. Your father won't be coming along. They are getting divorced. You are nine years old. Your mother takes your brother and sister to live with her on the coast. You decide to move in with your father. You feel sorry for him all alone, without any kids. He seems sad. You are sensitive to people who are alone and sad. In the first year, your father tries to make it fun, and it is fun sometimes, especially when your brother moves in and he takes you on educational trips around the country, even Europe. But in general, your dad's an all-around unpleasant man. On that, everyone in the family agrees. Even his own mother refers to him as ruthless. He's an engineer, exceedingly practical, and after a while, his new idea of fun is to drive you and your brother to his work sites to teach you how to install plumbing and windows and lay bricks. He wants you to know how physical objects work. One day on a trip to the mall to buy books, you discover something in an electronic store that will change your life. It's sitting in the corner past the Kenwood receivers and JBL speakers, a handful of machines that look like televisions with a fat white keyboard attached. It's like something from the future just landed in your town. You are in awe. You quickly spin through the attached manual. Whoa, holy crap. This machine can be programmed to do a person's bidding? The clerk has seen this starry look before, but it's usually reserved for the latest turntable. Sure can. It's a Commodore VIC-20 the best personal computer money can buy. 
You can't wait to get your hands on it. You hound your father for months to buy you one, but he's skeptical. Says it's a waste of money, just a passing fad. He's always skeptical of your passions. Your father has a knack for sucking the joy out of everything. But you don't give up. When you see a flyer for a computer symposium being held in the city, you beg your father to get you in. It's a class for adults, with computer experts coming in from all over the world. And to his credit, he tries. Probably just to shut you up. The sponsors finally agree, but you have to wear a suit and sit off to the side and not say a word. Your father drops you off with firm instructions to be outside promptly at 6 o'clock when the symposium is finished. He doesn't want to go in, and he doesn't want to be kept waiting. Is it your fault you lose track of time? At 6 o'clock, for all you know, you've landed on a planet in an alternate universe. You've stripped off your suit jacket and are asking the group every question you can think of. That's where your father finds you. Holding court in the center, shirt sleeves rolled up to the elbows, tie misplaced. You this boy's father? I am. Is he misbehaving? You can see your father starting to work himself up. Quite the opposite. He has one of the most original minds I think we've encountered. Especially for a ten-year-old. Your father looks startled. Clearly not what he was expecting. Sometimes too smart for his own good. You need to get him a computer. And that's how you come to own the Commodore VIC-20. After your father waits for it to go on sale. Invest in the wonder computer of the 1980s for under $300. The Commodore VIC-20. Unlike games, it has a real computer keyboard. The computer comes with a workbook. Six months of lessons teaching the user how to operate the machine. You finish them all in three days. Then you teach yourself to program it. One year later, you invent a video game. You call it Blastar. The good guys and the bad guys are represented by little Atari blobs. Square, chunky letters up top keep track of the score. The player pilots a hero spaceship, and the goal is to take out alien freighters before they destroy you with H-bombs and status beam machines. No one knows what status beam machines are, even you, but who cares? Finally, you get a chance to apply science fiction to something real. Sort of. The video game is simple, but good enough for the magazine, PC, and office technology. They offer you $500 for the code and then publish it. $500! You feel rich. Your interest in computers doesn't exactly make you popular. There's just no getting around that you think different from everyone else, and because you're so small, you don't look like everyone else either. And that's how you find yourself at the bottom of the stairs, getting your head bashed in by some tough crew cuts. That beating will put you in the hospital. You just got home from work, and you're tired at the thought of trying to pull together something for dinner. You wish there were a way to have a fresh, delicious meal on the table in 15 minutes, but you know that's a pipe dream. Except that I just discovered this meal prep service called Gobble that makes that dream a reality. Easy, tasty meals in 15 minutes in one pan. Really? Well, how do they do it? Well, Gobble has an army of sous chefs doing all the prep work. They take care of the peeling, chopping, marinating, creating the perfect sauces, always using the highest quality ingredients, and is delivered fresh to your doorstep. This week on Gobble's menu, pumpkin gnocchi with rutabaga and apple, and green pizzoli with purple hominy and a cheese quesadilla. I don't know yet what's on its way to me because I like to live dangerously, but I am so thrilled to try this service out, and I want you to try it too. Gobble's offering listeners of Imagined Life a fantastic limited-time deal. $50 off your first box. Just go to gobble.com slash imagined to get $50 off. One more time, that's gobble.com slash imagined. When your father comes to visit you in the hospital, he doesn't even recognize your swollen face. He brings you home, and it takes a week before you fully recover. 
Your nose will never quite be the same, and by the time you have enough money to get it fixed, you'll have lived several lifetimes. By age 14, the beatings are an almost everyday occurrence. You grow numb to the pain. It's just another part of your day. Sneaking through the hallways of junior high, trying to outrun the bullies to the exit and then get home. You've gotten pretty good at it. They're not very smart. Sometimes you even make a game of it with your best friend, your only friend. A fellow outsider you met last year who accepts you exactly as you are. At last, you aren't alone. But then the bullies get to him. It starts one morning when they punch him out before class. You see him by the lockers, bleeding through the nose. You know who's responsible. And you know it's because of you. Jesus, man, are you okay? Bleeding like a stuck pig. Did they say anything? Your friend wipes the back of his nose with his sleeve, leaving a trail of blood on his worn jean jacket. Not really. The usual stuff. They told me they were going to squash me like they squashed my maggot friend. They're morons. I won't let them get to me. Except they do get to him. After a few more beatings, they tell him it's going to get worse unless he stops being your friend. How do you know this? Because now he is avoiding you. When you see him in the hall, he looks down and walks the other way. You hope it blows over. And then it does. One day he sees you in the hall and looks you in the eye and smiles. It's an odd smile, sort of a half grin that doesn't go all the way up. But hey, at least he's smiling. And that makes you smile too. You try to play it nonchalant, but you're exploding with happiness. You missed the guy, damn it. Hey man, how's it going? Hey, uh, sorry I haven't really been around. Tests and all that. Yeah, I get it. I know how it is. You want to hook up after school? Maybe ride over to Magnolia Dell? Hell yeah! Cool. I'll meet you out front by the fountain. All day you're walking on air. You've got a few bucks in your pocket just ready to burn. You'll buy a couple of Fantas and some chips. You guys will head over to the park and fly through the field and maybe have a little picnic. You're dying to tell him about this idea you've been tossing around in your head to open a video game arcade. Maybe the two of you can even be partners. When the last bell rings, you fly out of the door, your eyes darting around looking for the familiar jean jacket. And then you see him. He's standing with the bullies, and he's not looking at you anymore. It's a setup. You feel like you've been punched in the gut. As the bullies advance, you don't even try to escape. Even though the beating doesn't last long, it's just meant to prove a point, it hurts more than the one that landed you in the hospital. The pain of betrayal always leaves the biggest scars. As if hiding from school bullies weren't bad enough, each day you have to go home to your father and his negative attitude. For the slightest infraction, he'll sit you and your brother down at the kitchen table and lecture you for three to four hours about the way things are. And heaven forbid you don't look absolutely riveted or he'll start berating you, making the lecture even longer. You get good at faking fascination while drifting off in your mind, painting mental pictures of what your future life will look like somewhere far, far away from this place. Somewhere dreams can breathe and you can make something of yourself. Your father knows about dreams. He had a few of his own as a young man, most of them squandered by what you'll later, as an adult, see as his own narcissism and greed. He's envious of people with dreams, even his own son. Maybe he wants to spare you the disappointment he's had to face. That's what you tell yourself on days you feel generous. Days when you're not, you think of him as a dream crusher. But once an idea takes hold, it spills out of your every pore, and you have a new great idea. It's such a vivid and exciting world out there, you try to convince your father to come along for the ride. Listen, we can move in three months, at the end of the school year. There are lots of engineering opportunities, you'll make twice what you make now. Instead, your father sends the housekeeper away, 
and tells you it's now your job to clean the house top to bottom. And don't miss an inch or he'll know. At age 14, you start to question the meaning of life. And not one of those run-of-the-mill existential crises, or when you're pop philosophizing with your high school friends. It's a straight drop down into the black abyss. This doubt keeps you up at night and overpowers everything else that used to take up space in your brain. What does it all matter? The history of man is riddled with self-destruction, war, and grief. Hell, your own life is grief from the moment you get to school until it's time for bed. Is this how life is going to be? You are desperate for answers, for something, anything to seep through this feeling of throttling despair. You turn to books for answers. Big books, important books, written for the academic mind. The kind of books grad students who study religion and philosophy devour at three in the morning. Heavy German authors like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, who write about the death of God and the pain of the soul. You are subsumed by depression. Some days it's hard to get out of bed. But then you discover a book in the science fiction section of the library. You've seen the cover before, a hitchhiker's thumb on a wall of blue outer space. Behind it, a fluorescent green planet with a round open mouth smile. It's called Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This book saves you. It's about the misadventures of the last surviving man who leaves Earth with an alien rider to explore other galaxies. A raucous ramble through outer space with humor and silliness and the possibility of a future with a happy ending. You take its message to heart. You have a purpose now. Save the planet and make the world a better place. At 16, you'll switch schools, enroll in karate, and judo, and finally have a growth spurt you thought would never come. You still don't feel like you belong, but you keep your head down, try to shut off your father's voice, and plan your escape. You know where you want to go by now. America, the land of possibility. And you know exactly how you'll get there. At age 17, you'll leave college halfway through the first year to move to Canada, where it'll be easier to get a U.S. passport. There, you'll enroll in college, get the grades you need to get into one of the Ivy League schools. All part of the plan. You're good at plans. When you leave home, your father calls you an idiot, says you will never make anything of yourself. His final words, an angry prediction. You'll be back in three months. He's wrong. You will never go home again. Your confidence is important, and sometimes one change can make all the difference. Hair Club knows this, and they're inviting you to become part of the Hair Club family to see how getting the most out of your hair can change your life. Hair Club has a legacy of success that goes back 40 years. They understand the emotions you're feeling and know the questions you have. So whether you're looking to revitalize growth of your own hair or to learn more about the latest proven methods for hair replacement or restoration, Hair Club's professionally trained stylists, hair health experts, and consultants will craft a personalized solution to ensure you feel your best and get the most out of your hair. See for yourself just how powerful great hair can be. Go to hairclub.com imagine today for a free hair analysis and a free take-home hair kit, all valued over $300. That's hairclub.com imagined for a free hair analysis and free hair care kit. Experience your hair and your life at its best, only with Hair Club. At last, you are free. You're 17, and you travel through Canada performing odd jobs. You work on a farm, shoveling grain, and then luck into a high-paying job at a lumberyard cleaning boilers. It's a high-risk job, but that's why it pays the big bucks. You have to put on a hazmat suit and shimmy through a tight tunnel, pushing yourself along by your toes. You carry a shovel to scoop up steaming hot sand, then shimmy back through the other way. They tell you to watch the time, 
If you're wedged in there more than 30 minutes, you'll get too hot and die. 30 people start out on the job. By the end of the week, there are three. You are one of them. You are driven by urgency and a nagging fear that someone will send you back home. And that simply can't happen. You enroll at a university in Canada as planned, and when your mother and brother fly over and announce they are staying for good, you breathe a little easier. You and your brother have always shared a sense of adventure, and since you don't really know anyone, you decide it's time to meet people who matter. You enlist your brother in the plan. Who do you want to meet? What field? Any field. Open up the paper and pick someone. You're nuts. Okay, how about Fred Zimmerman? Who's that? Head chef at the Westin? His team just won the Culinary Classic. Come on, man, think bigger. Fine. How about the head of marketing for the Blue Jays? Let's call him up. Oh, and we gotta have a banker. With all the money, banks run the world. How about Peter Nicholson? Bank of Nova Scotia? Guy's an executive. He'll never meet with us. Never know till you try. And so begins a barrage of cold calls. The plan. Invite each person out for lunch. Mostly you don't get any farther than a polite secretary who becomes less polite over time. But rejection is no deterrence. After the kind of rejection you've been through, this is nothing. It's now a tool in your survival kit. You don't take it personally. After six months of persistence, your strategy pays off. The executive from the bank finally agrees to lunch, and after the meeting, he is so impressed with your determination, he offers you a summer internship. When you form your first company, he will be your first advisor. But before that happens, you get your ticket to America in the form of admission to the University of Pennsylvania. You decide to major in physics and math. Fields that will help you make the kind of difference you've wanted to make since reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. After you graduate, you enroll in Stanford to earn your PhD. It's a progressive West Coast school without all the East Coast baggage. But the halls of academia feel confined and staid. This isn't your place. You know it from the moment you take a seat in the lecture hall and hear the professor's droning voice launch into statistical equilibrium. Stanford is where things are learned. You're ready to do. Two days later, you drop out. If you're going to make your mark on the world, you need to start now. You and your brother decide to do something together. You both want to make an impact. For now, it's tech. It's the mid-1990s and tech is growing. There are so many possibilities. Maybe online ads for businesses, you think? Something with interactive maps and directions. Bring them into the age of the internet. And that's how it starts. You move to Silicon Valley and open an office barely the size of a studio apartment. There's no shower or kitchen and the toilet is constantly clogged, but you don't care. You're making it happen. You eat fast food four meals a day and shower at the Y. You drill a hole in the wall and drop down an ethernet cord to share internet with the business downstairs and then make a deal with another company who gives you their technology for free. You are up and running in three months. You rent a small apartment, put a mattress on the floor, and then bring on an intern from South Korea. Give him room and board in exchange for his work. And then you hire a sales force of one, a laid back guy who, like you, doesn't take rejection personally. An important trait since there's a lot of it in the early days. It takes three months for him to bring in the first check, but it's a check that validates your dream. By the end of the year, you have a small staff, a motley but dedicated crew, and they're geeks. You get each other. If you could, you'd work all day. You resent anything that takes you away. You buy a beanbag chair and put it next to your desk. When you can't keep your eyes open, that's where you fall. That's where you dream. You tell your staff to kick you awake when they come in. You're still a bit rough around the edges. You secretly believe you're smarter than everyone in the room, and sometimes not so secretly. You hate the word no. The word impossible drives you into a frenzy. You aren't a touchy-feely guy. Your employees know that, though they probably don't know the full story of how you got this way. But your emotional wall keeps you protected. 
and you keep guards on constant watch on those walls. One day, your employees invite you on a Saturday morning bike ride. That's when you realize you've never done anything with your employees outside of work. Maybe it's a good idea. Team building and all that. If only there was more time in a day. On Mars, there's a whole 30 minutes more than on Earth's paltry 24 hours. What would it be like to work on another planet? When the day of the bike ride arrives, you meet in a turnout in the Santa Cruz Mountains at five in the morning. Your employees are geared up in cargo shorts, bike shoes, and helmets. The sun hasn't even come out yet, but you can tell it's going to be a hot one. The kind of heat that makes you grit your teeth. It reminds you of home, which also makes you grit your teeth. But the place you grew up is not home anymore. America is your home now. It's where you'll raise your children, surrounded by white picket fences and big leafy lanes, and encourage them to dream as big as they can. As you unpack your bikes, there's not a lot of talking. Everyone is still in their heads. You mount up and start the ride. It's gentle at first. Winding road through tall, lush pines, a steep coast down. And then, on the bend, you see it ahead of you. And it's big. The hill. You saw it on the map, but you didn't imagine it would be quite this, well, huge. 2,000 feet straight up. And then, on an unspoken signal, everyone is pedaling. Hard. Giddy up, Rimrod. Watch the car. Cars can go around. Everyone's getting competitive. You know that feeling. You've had to compete for everything you've earned in your life. And suddenly, the team sets off at a breakneck pace, leaving you in the dust. They are no longer a bunch of computer geeks. They are competitors. They have trained for this moment, and each one is hungry to win. This is what it's about, you think. Chariots of fire. Hell yeah! And then the group fades away, and you are alone on the road. Just the sound of your tires and the birds in the trees. You stand off your seat to give your legs more force to push down on the pedals, but the mountain has other ideas. Get off the bike. Come and join me, it calls. You drop your head and drill down. You are inside the Heart of Gold spaceship on a hitchhiker's trip through the galaxy, and you can't breathe. It's times like these I really wish I'd listened to what my mother told me when I was young. What did your mother tell you? Suddenly you are back in the fields of your childhood, your brother riding a bike by your side, your destiny, your hands. Far in the distance, the sound of the wind is broken by the echoes of someone throwing up. He's the first to reach the top, and now he's paying the price in great heaves. Good for him. You push on. Space, it says, is big. Really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's just peanuts to space. Bigger than this mountain, you think. Your lungs are beginning to prick, painful and hot. Your breathing is heavy. It's you against the hill. The wind has died away. Focus. Focus. Your thigh muscles strain, your stomach clenches, sweat drips off your nose, and finally you see the top. It's still another 500 feet. In the distance, your guys, your team, looking down. One of them waves. You will your legs to keep pushing. Right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. Keep moving forward. No one would blame you for stopping. You can almost hear the guys silently urging. Walk the bike up the rest of the way. It's okay. But that's when you see it. The sun breaking over the hill. What is that line from the book? There is a moment in every dawn when light floats. There is the possibility of magic. Creation holds its breath. You're floating. You're pushing. Embracing the pain. You can do anything. In three years, at 28 years old, you will sell your first company for more than $300 million. 
A year after that, you will help transform how money is exchanged when you found a company called X.com that later becomes PayPal. In 12 years, you will invent a new kind of car called Tesla and build a rocket and send it into space with your company SpaceX. But right now, as you crest the peak, you are one with a mountain. You are Elon Musk. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Imagined Life. If you did, please subscribe right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast, or you'll find a link on the episode notes and some offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. If you'd like to learn more about Elon Musk, we recommend Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the quest for a fantastic future by Ashley Vance. It has many more stories about Elon, including how he developed Tesla and SpaceX. If you like what you're hearing, we'd love you to give us a five-star rating and tell your friends to subscribe. Another way to support us is to answer a short survey at wandry.com survey. And a quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they're based on real historical research. I'm your host, Robbie Damon. Stephanie Jens wrote this episode. Sound design is by Jeff Schmidt. Editing assistance by Sergio Enriquez. Theme music by Breakmaster Cylinder. Imagined Life is executive produced by Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louie and created by Hernan Lopez for Wondery. For those of you great guessers out there, Let's put your skills to good use. Don't just imagine what it would be like to listen to any book you want on your morning commute. Make it a reality with an Audible membership. You can win three months of free listening to books like The Diana Chronicles by Tina Brown or Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance. So, how to win? After each Imagined Life episode, we'll give you a clue about next week's episode. Then, if you head over to wondery.com slash imaginelife to submit your guess, you'll be entered for a chance to win your free three-month membership to Audible. This week's clue is, you were a cover girl before you were a big screen legend. Have an idea? Go to wondery.com slash imaginelife to submit your guess, or find a link in the episode notes.